Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ADA Group's financial year 2022 figures. I'm Sebastian Lehmann, Head of Investor Relations, and I will guide you through. As usual, before we get started, please carefully read our legal disclaimer. So today's presentation is a bit longer than the last quarterly presentations. So we're going to start with an overview on the current market environment, then coming to our key figures, and finally, the outlook for the current year. Let us begin with the current market environment. Overall, and at the beginning of 2023, the global economy is in a fragile state. On the one side, we see the easing of the corona pandemic, the reopening of the Chinese market, and the easing in global supply chains. On the other hand, Russia's ongoing war on the Ukraine, the increasing geopolitical tensions in several regions of the world, the continued high inflation, and the rising interests are weighing on the development of the global economy. Overall, the IMF is forecasting a growth of just 2.9% for the global economy this year, after a growth of 3.4% last year. And there are several other and additional risks and uncertainties, namely the increasing wages, the possible energy shortages and the supply chains, the rising prices for energy, and of course, shortage of skilled professionals. So this all can weigh on consumer sentiment. Ladies and gentlemen, this all is building or setting the stage for the global economic development in 2023. Now, in the midst of this development, there is a fundamental change of the mobility industry. And this change is even accelerating. And as this has a tremendous impact on the business of engineering services providers like ELAC, I would like to explain to you in a bit more detail what this transition really means and looks like. So please follow me to the next slide. And this is a bit more complicated. So I will have to explain in more detail here. First of all, we have to clear up with a common misunderstanding. Many people think that the fundamental transformation in the mobile industry is currently based on the shift from internal combustion engines to electric mobility. But that is just one part of the transformation. There are two other facts that I would like to explain to you here. First of all, we have to talk about electric architectures. What does this mean? Well, please look at the left side of the chart where we have the schematic illustration of today's infrastructure of a car and tomorrow's architecture. Today and traditionally, OEMs are developing a car and then they are integrating a large number of ECUs from a multitude of suppliers in their cars. So these ECUs have different functions, for example, for air condition, for braking system, for your infotainment system, etc. Now, the problem here is that these ECUs are usually supplied as a so-called system solution. This means the supplier is not only supplying a piece of hardware, but also its own embedded software on that ECU. And this software controls the respective function of the ECU. And now, if you look into the chart and see the different ECUs, this mixture of ECUs is or makes it extremely complex, if not impossible, to fulfill two major needs of the car of the future. The one major need is software updates over the air, and the other one is a holistic connectivity and cybersecurity. So to fulfill these two characteristics, the software-defined car requires a totally new electric architecture. We have put a schematic illustration right here on the chart. So the electric architecture of the future will be a centralized or split into zonal zones. Central high performance computing systems will process the incoming data of the car and give corresponding commands to actuators in the car. As a consequence, there will be less ECUs in the future car, but more actuators without embedded software. Now the separation of hardware and software will disrupt well-established tier value chains in the automotive industry. And this is just one part of the transformation. Let's move on to the right side of the chart. Here you can see the schematic illustration of the three layers of the software-defined car. So far, we have been talking about layer one, the basic hardware infrastructure. Now it's comparable to your computer at home. When you have your basic hardware infrastructure, you need an operating system to run that computer. And it's more or less the same with the car. 
in order to control the car functions, the data streams, the gateways, an operating system or a so-called car OS is necessary. And this is the layer two of the software defined cars. For automotive OEMs, this is currently a buy or build, sometimes also a buy and build strategy. So we see some OEMs are trying to develop their own operating system, whilst others are buying them from big tech companies. And as we have recently read in the press, there are also OEMs that are developing one part of the OS and buying another one. We will see which way will prove to be the right one, but one thing is for sure, until then there is a lot of development work to be done. So now, once these two first layers of the software defined car are ready, there is the third layer and that's the application level, uh, layer. So there will be some basic applications in the future car that are necessary to run the car, but there will be more kind of an app store maybe where you can buy, you as a passenger can buy different functions from different suppliers, from tech companies to in order to do some online shopping, video games, reading or whatever in the car. So these are the three layers. And uh, finally, there is another, let's say, cross-dimensional layer, and this is cybersecurity. OEM will have to make sure that cybersecurity will be an integral part in the entire development process across all the three layers. This requires new development processes and cooperation between OEM, suppliers, and engineering services providers across the entire value chain. So to sum this chart up, the fundamental transformation in the mobility industry consists not only in new drivetrains, but also in new architectures and the three layers of the software-defined car. As a consequence, historic value chains are disrupted. Hardware and software will be separated. OEMs are likely to gain value add, while suppliers will have to find a new place in the value chain of the future. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the playing field that drives the market for engineering services providers over the next years. OEMs will need technical support in many areas in order to define, integrate, and optimize new value chains for the mobility of the future. Now, we think engineering services providers will be an integral part of this transformation. Thanks to the enlargement of our service portfolio, especially in the software and digitalization area, and thanks to our independency, we are the perfect partner to support and accelerate the change. Let's move on to the next slide where I will get into more details what this change means in terms of numbers and potentials. As you may know, our business model is depending to a large extent from the R&D expenses of OEMs. Now, in this chart, we show to you recent studies from the German Automotive Manufacturer Association, and they estimate that the German automotive industry is going to spend around 220 billion euro for research and development until 2026. And in addition, another 100 billion euros for new or modificated plants in Germany. So this sums up to a total of 320 billion euros until 2026. And this refers only to the German automotive industry. We have not talked about other established OEMs. We have not talked about startup companies and not about companies from outside the automotive industry. This all is the total addressable market for us here at the ADA Group. So the fundamental transformation that I have just explained continues and OEMs and their suppliers need to invest heavily into new cars, into new models, into software and digitalization batteries, but also production facilities. We as EDARC experience a large demand and we see a growing potential for our innovative and agile business model over the next years. So far, we have talked about our market and the potentials. Now let's get on to the next slide where we talk about the execution here at the EDARC group. With the 2021 financial year figures, our management gave out five key activities for the year 2022. And these are shown here on this chart. We start with expanding our business. In 2022, we managed to increase our revenues by more than 15%. And on top of that, we are posting the largest order intake in the company's history. So clearly expanding our business was a very successful last year. In terms of efficiency, the second point, 
the company has managed to increase its margin by even 65%. So we see a disproportionately growth of earnings over revenues. Another check here for this topic. Now talking about software and digitalization. Last year, our segment electrics, electronics has been posting a growth of 20%. So it is by far exceeding the growth of the other segments. We have employed new colleagues all over the world and especially in our so-called best cost country in Malaysia, where we have built up about 100 new employees in the area of software and digitalization. But 2022 was not only about financials, it was also about non-financials. And this brings me to the next point, which is sustainability. The target for last year was to decrease the CO2 emission per employee by in between 8 to 10%. In fact, we have managed to significantly lower the CO2 emissions of the EDA group by more than 50%. More details on this will be published with our annual sustainability report, which is due in mid of April. And finally, let us talk about people. EDAC has, of course, a people-related business. We need good people, well-educated people, and we need to attract and retain the best talents in the market. When we talk about attracting the talents, last year we have increased our workforce by more than 500 people, but it's not about only hiring, it's also about retention. So if we compare our churn rate, which was roughly 40% last year, to some of our main competitors who are posting a churn rate of in between 18 to even more than 23%, you can clearly see that retention is also a big success here in our company. So far, ladies and gentlemen, this has been the five key activities for 2022. Now let's get over to the key figures of this year. Overall, the revenues are up by 15.8% to a total of 796.1 million euros. This is the highest revenue that our company has ever recorded. The growth was mainly driven from the German customers who are finally coming back to the market and investing heavily into new technologies, but also from startup companies and all other well-established OEM in the world. If we look into our three segments, you see that all of them are growing. Vehicle engineering posting a solid growth of 9.3%, electrics, electronics outposting the market with a growth of 20%, and production solutions now finally back to the growth paths, posting a double-digit increase of 12.9%. Now, how does this transfer into the margin? The margin is up disproportionately by 65% to a total of 50.5 million euros. Our corresponding adjusted EBIT margin levels at 6.3%. Here again, if we look into the three segments, all of them have managed to increase their margins compared to the previous year. And especially if we look into production solutions, they have finally managed to get back to profitability after posting a loss of 3.6% last year. This year's margin is up to a positive 1.6%. Let us talk about some more important metrics here in this chart. Headcount, we've already talked about it, is up by more than 500 people to a total of 8,400 people. Earnings after tax, and this is the next good news for our shareholders, is even disproportionately up compared to the adjusted EBIT. It's up by 154% to a total of 28.9 million euros. This means that earnings per share are now at 1 euro 15, and the dividend proposal for the year 2022 will be 55 euro cents per share. This means an increase in the dividend of 175% compared to last year's dividend. Our CapEx is up to 30.1 million euro and the CapEx ratio levels at 3.8% of revenues. For this year, we expect CapEx still to be slightly above this in between 4 to 5% of revenues as we are currently building a big testing facility in Germany. And finally, talking about the equity, as the overall earnings are up, so is equity. It's now at 148.9 million euros and the equity ratio is at 20.6%. Another important metric for us, of course, is the trade working capital. And year over year, the trade working capital is up by more than 70 million euros. This upstick is mainly based on the increased business with our German, but also other traditional customers that are well established on the market. Just as a reminder for you, with these customers, we have fixed payment terms as a rule. So if business with them is picking up, 
so is our work in capital. And you clearly see here with this increase of 70 million euros that the business with these clients is picking up in 2022. As we are expecting further growth with these customers over this year, trade working capital may also rise this year. But here again, just as a reminder, we do currently post a level of trade working capital of just 12% of our revenues. In pre-crisis years, this ratio was sometimes even above 20%. So we are still well in line with all our metrics. Let's get over to the cash flows. In the Q3 call, our management has guided for a positive operating cash flow for the full year. As you can see, this target has been met, but we have even managed to exceed the previous year's level in operating cash flow. But even more pleasingly is the free cash flow development. It's also positive, and this despite the high outflows in trade working capital and the increased capex spendings. So overall, we are more than happy with the cash flow development in the year 2022. Finally, before coming to our outlook, let us have a quick view on our net financial debt. As always, we are showing this in two pillars. The left pillar is always including the leasing liabilities and the right pillar is excluding leasing liabilities. So year over year, you see an increase in uh, net financial debt of roughly 64 million euros. But if you look into the details, you see that this increase is almost solely attributable to an increase in leasing liabilities. So if we look at the net financial debt without leasing liabilities, you see a total of just 15.5 million euros at the end of last year. And this corresponds to a net gearing of just 10.4%. As you can see in the chart, we had about 122 million euros of cash on hand at the end of last year. And in addition to that, we had more than 105 million euros in available credit lines. So the overall financial situation remains very solid and we are well prepared to tackle all the challenges, but of course, also the opportunities that may lay ahead of us. So talking about the future, let's finally come to our outlook. For the full year 2023, we do expect a further growth, but also a stable earnings development. However, these estimates are subject to considerable uncertainties, which arise in particular from the war in Ukraine, from possible further geopolitical disputes, energy price and wage cost development, and also the availability of sufficient qualified staffs. Overall, we expect our revenue to grow by around 4 to 7%, and the adjusted EBIT margin is expected in a range of around 4 to 7%. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a quick run through the 2022 financial year figures. If you have any questions left or if you will require a meeting, please do not hesitate to contact me at any time. I will be more than happy to support you in any way. Thanks everyone for watching this video. Have a good day and bye-bye.